Welcome, thank you for joining us. In the year 2020, nearly all patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia will receive a non-chemotherapy approach to their treatment. With expanded use of novel targeted agents, the landscape of therapy for CLL is rapidly changing, and several questions remain unanswered as to which approach will be optimal for a given patient. In this Onc Live peer exchange discussion, I am joined by a panel of experts in the field of leukemia research. Together, we will look at the newest data, including that from the ASH 2019 annual meeting, to shed light on how therapy for CLL is evolving and the implications for clinical practice. I am Dr. Nicole Lamana, Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of CLL Research in the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center at Columbia University in New York. Today, I'm joined by several of my friends and colleagues, um, Dr. Farouk Awan, Associate Professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Jan Berger, Professor of Medicine Department of Leukemia, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Richard Furman, the Morton Coleman MD Distinguished Professor of Medicine and the Director of the CL Research Center at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York. And Dr. Javier Pinilla, Senior Member in the Department of Malignant Heme Hematology at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. Thank you for joining us, let's begin. So first, what I'd like to do is talk about newly diagnosed patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So how exactly, when you have a newly diagnosed patient, you know, what um, testing do you do? What risk stratification do you do, if any at all? Baruch, you wanna? Sure, thank you. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I can start off by you presenting the usual case scenario. A lot of our patients typically present with an incidental finding of leukocytosis on a routine blood test that they had for as part of their routine medical care and as part of their uh, testing for a surgical procedure or an elective procedure, and that's how they get diagnosed with leukocytosis, and then they get referred to us or to their oncologist, and that's when they get a flow cytometry done. And I think that's a very stressful period in the time uh, of their lives, and especially when the diagnosis comes back as CLL, and that's considered a cancer for them, and that's a big word. Um, a lot of questions arise, and um, before the patient even gets to us, a lot of time I feel that they have had the diagnosis established through a flow cytometry, but unfortunately along with that comes a label that, hey, this is a good leukemia to have. And I think their perception is that, you know, I'm gonna be fine uh, and that I don't have to worry about any of this and this is uh, not gonna be an issue. But I think uh, while that might be true for a lot of patients, a lot of times we have to do a systematic workup actually establish whether they're in the good risk group or the more aggressive risk group. So I feel that a lot of my time is, is spent counseling the patient about, hey, this is not a very homogeneous disease. This is a disease that has different presentations, that, that has different trajectories. And the way I do it is essentially follow the CLL-IPI score or components of that, which includes the FISH testing, which includes the IGHV and the TP53 mutation analysis. Once I have the results of all their high-risk or low-risk prognostic markers, we then sit down and come up with a plan. Okay, you fall into this particular risk category based on your IPI score or based on your other genetic markers, and this is the frequency of follow-up that I would advise, and then this is your predicted time to treatment and your overall outcomes. So I think... Uh, we cannot automatically assume that all CLL patients will do really well because we have all experienced patients who have really aggressive disease and they do really poorly. So it's a discussion with the patient, but I typically would do a comprehensive workup at initial diagnosis, including an IGHV mutational status, including TP53 mutation analysis, and a FISH testing at the same time on presentation. Now, some people defer that for when the patients actually need therapy, and I understand the rationale for that. However, the vast majority, and I have that discussion with my patient, but the vast majority of my patients really are interested in knowing how aggressive this thing is. How often do I follow up with you? And I feel that knowing the prognostic markers upfront allows me to make educated or give educated answers to those questions. So I have a question for and any of you. We'll mm. just go right next yeah. to you. It's come to our attention through some of our, you know, either older and newer CLL registries that many of the physicians do not test for cytogenetics, FISH, or IGBH testing in the community. Um, and you know, the argument being, can it be done at the time of their first treatment? How do you, we're a little bit spoiled because we're in academic centers, but you know, what do you feel about that? 
So I think, you know, prognostic markers really represent an interesting area right now in CLL. You know, fortunately, our therapies work regardless of the prognostic marker most of the time. And so the question in 2020 that's most important is which prognostic markers are going to really be impactful and important to know. So actually, the, the one area that I'm most concerned with, um, with regard to patients having poor outcomes, is going to be the risk of a Richter's transformation. And that's something that often would exist from diagnosis on. So looking at which stereotyped V gene they may have or whether or not they're notch mutated or, or are all important things to do at diagnosis. So I do do my testing at diagnosis um, with the understanding of, of course, that you know sometimes this might not be information that the patient will be very happy about, but it, you know most patients do want to know the information ahead of time, even if we don't know at this time how to intervene in a way that would help diminish that risk. I think with regard to initiation of therapy, I mean, you know, as most of the therapies will be the same, regardless of the prognostic marker, but I still think it's important to know, and I do think we will, in the future, have information regarding, you know, which patients might be most appropriate or best treated, rather, with a single-agent BTK inhibitor versus the patient who needs a BTK inhibitor therapy plus a BCL2 inhibitor. You know, who are the patients that need a little bit extra and who are not? Because we now have long-term data with ibrutinib really showing that if you have good prognostics, you're going to do extremely well for a long period of time. Okay, so it sounds like uh, education and testing are important. What about CT imaging? Do you guys do that baseline on your patients? I personally don't do not do that, and nor the above marrow evaluation. I think we have uh, really enough information for peripheral blood to really assess all these prognostic markers. Maybe exceptions when the patients may really present with a bulky lymphadenopathy or situation where they have some symptomatic lymphadenopathy, or even in, in some instances where the patients are high risk, who, who, who I may really discuss the the, the CAT scans, but otherwise I, I don't think it's indicated and obviously it's something that we unfortunately we see in, in some centers where they, they've been followed every six months or every so on with CAT scan for a long period of time which I don't think has any, any meaningful really impact of the care of those patients. So for now in my practice I, I only really perform this imaging testing when there's really a reason for which patients may really complain about a uh, symptom or, or there is a uh, a new onset of uh, lymphadenopathy who can really produce some, some other abnormalities. The same thing happened with, obviously with the bone marrow that we discussed many, many times that is not indicated a diagnosis, although uh, before the start therapy for sure, a CAT scan and, and a bone marrow in my opinion is indicated to really have a baseline characteristic of this patient.